we all carry whole worlds in our head, in our heads. Whole worlds in our bodies. There's a cartoon I saw one time of a meditator. First the meditator is sitting very quietly, and then the word think appears in her head. And then there's another think that gets added on in her neck, another one in her chest. And by the end of the cartoon, it's just all think, 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 think all over the body. That's the way it is with us. Our bodies are filled with thoughts. We think of the thoughts as filling the mind, but also, they also take their place in the body as well. The mind is what does the thinking, but there's a part of the body that gets involved in the process. This is how we carry those whole worlds around. You sit here with your body, and all of a sudden it seems like you're someplace else. It's all happening here, right here in the mind and the body, right here in the present moment, but it's another world and another time. It's like those control keys on computer keyboards. If you ordinarily push a, a P or a Q, you get a P or a Q on the screen. But if you press, press the control button and you press the P, then you get something else. The machine prints. Press the control on the queue, and it quits. All of a sudden, the key does something else. It's the same with the mind and the body in the present moment. You press that control key, and all of a sudden, you've got another world. It's not just the body sitting here breathing. It's Thailand, or Europe, or New York, Texas, whatever. In addition to the worlds that we intentionally carry around, there are lots of unintentional ones that come blowing through our minds. And a lot of that's through the force of our old actions. And as those storms are blowing, blowing through, sometimes the best you can do is just hold on to the breath, as you would batten down for a storm. Just lie down and hold on for, tight for dear life as the winds blow through. Stay with the breath as much as you can. They, in the Discourse on Foundations of Mindfulness, the first stage you're told to subdue grief and, excuse me, subdue greed and sorrow with regard to the world. In other words, as, in other words, as these various worlds come through you in the present moment, maybe you can't stop them from happening, but make sure that you do subdue any greed or sorrow with regard to the various worlds that come through. In other words, try to be as equanimous as possible, as uninvolved as possible in the process. And as much as you consciously can, stay with a breath. As you keep this up after a while, the, the storms begin to calm down. And if you're holding on to the breath consistently enough, then you begin to see things a little bit more precisely. You see more and more how much you are doing to conspire with those various worlds coming in. But the initial principle is whatever conscious decisions you're making, okay, make sure they're conscious decisions to stay with the breath. And at the very least, just don't get involved in other things that come along. This, is a this helps establish your viewpoint or a standpoint in the mind. Without this, you just get blown around all the time. And even though this standpoint may be a fabrication as well, it's a useful fabrication. And in the beginning, you hardly notice it as fabrication. You just notice it as the place where you stand still, where you take your stance and try to stay as solid as possible, as uninvolved as possible. so that your frame of reference doesn't shift, so that you don't find yourself all of a sudden in New York or Texas or wherever. You're right here. Those other worlds are coming through, but they're coming through right here. 
and you do your best. Even though you may get involved a little bit, make sure at least there is no greed or sorrow with regard to these worlds as they come through. In other words, you don't get involved in any narratives that would pull you in even further. So sometimes this re requires just standing still with the breath. Other times it requires reflecting on those various worlds. What do they give, to you, give you? What do they hold for you? How real are they? There's a passage where Ratabala is talking to a king who wants to know why Ratabala wanted to ordain. After all, he's young, his family's wealthy, his parents are still alive. He himself is, he is healthy. Why, do you, why would anybody like that when ordained? And Ratabala says he, con he considered that all worlds are swept away, they don't endure. In other words, the principle of inconstancy, impermanence. They offer no shelter. There's no one in charge. No one can protect you from the suffering of those worlds. The world has nothing of its own. One has to pass on, leaving everything behind. And the principle of not-self, there's nothing you really can hold on to in, in any of these worlds. No matter how much you grasp at them, they just slip right through your fingers. And finally, the world Worlds are insufficient, insatiable, a slave to craving. No matter how good they get, there's still it's not enough for the mind. Once the mind has that sense of desire for these things, it's never fulfilled. In the place the Buddha himself said, if it rained gold coins, we still wouldn't have enough for our desires. Because all these things keep slipping away, slipping away. They're impermanence. Stressful, not self. There's no real protection. There's nothing you can really hold on to. When you reflect on this, it makes it easier to let go of these worlds as they're coming through. If you have any temptation to want to get ensnared in one, in one particular world, it seems interesting. Just reflect on this. No matter how good it gets, it's never really enough. And in the meantime, it can cause a lot of suffering, not only for you, but for the people around you. You sit here with this mind that's capable of creating this world. You sit here in a human body, the staging ground for all these worlds, just keeping this human body alive. Think of how much other people have to suffer so that you have enough food, clothing, shelter, and medicine to keep going. So these worlds you're building are building not only on your own suffering, you're building on the suffering of others. And it's this line of thinking that helps get you more inclined to wonder, can you develop the skill where you don't have to build these worlds? The first step, as I just said, is learning just not to get involved in the worlds that come through the mind. Try to establish this frame of reference right here and right now, body in and of itself, even though it may not fill all your awareness right from the beginning. Even all these various worlds may keep wanting to move in, move in. You at least lay claim to a corner of your awareness and hold on. Basic principle being just don't get involved in anything else. Stay right here. And as you stay right here with more consistency, you find that you begin to fill up your awareness more with this frame of reference. This becomes more and more dominant. as you find that the breath gets really interesting. It's not just in and out. There are all kinds of variations on this flow of energy that comes from the body. And it's not just the breath and the body. It also tells you a lot about the mind. You begin to see the mind a lot more clearly as you're staying with the breath. As you get more absorbed in this frame of reference, body, feeling, feelings, mind, in and of themselves mental qualities in and of themselves. This is what helps keep you anchored. And you find that this more and more fills your awareness. It's your awareness filling the body without all those other 
worlds coming in, when you finally get a sense of seclusion that you're not getting involved in them, that's when you can settle down and write concentration. This gives you a stronger and stronger frame of reference right here. Then you look into that process where this frame of reference gets switched. You know, what is the control key that turns a simple P into a print command? That turns this process of fabrication in the mind into something else, another world. You have to be quick to catch these things happening. The quicker you are to notice the principle, this process of fabrication, even before it starts forming a world, it's just a little stirring in the mind. Your first step is to learn how to catch it and just dissolve it away. Catch it, dissolve it away. Make it your sport. As soon as there's any stirring that could turn into a world, as soon as you're aware of it's ha that it's happening, just breathe right through it. Release whatever tension there may be, whatever part of the body it may show itself. Because whatever thought happens in the mind, there's going to be a corresponding pattern of tension in the body. And when you're with the breath, you can see this clearly. It's like shooting rubber ducks in an arcade. Nothing really gets harmed. It's not They're not real ducks that you're shooting. Just try to get really good as a marksman. The Buddha gives an example of someone who's really good at firing arrows. Can pierce great masses, can fire arrows in rapid succession. In other words, when you, you want to shoot down this process of fabrication as quickly as you can, once you've got this sense of being established in the body, in and of itself, feelings in and of themselves. As soon as it goes away from the in and of itself to becoming something else, shoot it down. And you find as you follow this process, you get quicker and quicker, and you begin to see more and more how you've been involved in the process. There are points where you make a decision, am I going to let this shift into another frame of reference? And there's that curiosity, what's this thought going to do? What's that thought going to do? Always hoping for something that's going to provide satisfaction. But if you keep in mind the fact these things never can provide enough satisfaction, no matter how great the world is. As the example Ratabhala gave, about the king who controls a really large, prosperous territory. Word comes that there's another territory to the east that he could overcome and rule as well. Okay, well, he goes and he overcomes that with his forces and rules that. Then he's told there's another one to the west. That he wants, he could send his army over there and probably beat them too. So he goes over to the west and just keeps expanding, expanding his territory. So he's got everything on this side of the ocean. Someone said there's something on the other side of the ocean. Well, go ahead and do that. That's the way it is with the mind. There's never a sense of enough. With these worlds, and never provide satisfaction. When you reflect on that, it's easier to work out this process of shooting them down, shooting them down. Any distraction that comes up that would disturb your concentration, you shoot it down as soon as you realize that it's happening. And the breath is very useful in that. And as your awareness begins to fill the body, you get more and more sensitive to obscure places where thoughts can land on the body or take different sensations in the body as their basis. The more complete your frame of reference fills the body, the quicker you are to see these things. The more refined the process, you can shoot down, shoot down. And then you begin to see, what are these things that the, these worlds are created out of? Well, there's nothing really much there either. It's just this little stirring here, a little stirring there. And you connect them up. You connect the dots. To what purpose? To what end? You begin to realize there's nothing really there of any real satisfaction. The worlds you create offer no satisfaction. The things that you create them out of, they're just very ephemeral. There's no real, there's nothing really solid that you can hold on to. The 
the sketch you more and more firmly established in your frames of reference, the body in and of itself, feelings, mind, before these things can turn into anything more elaborate. You keep things really cleaned out, cleared out, as uncomplicated as possible. Ultimately, your, your gaze will turn on the, on the basic building blocks themselves. Even this frame of reference that you've got, you understand ultimately that's a kind of becoming as well. There was an element of creation, an element of fabrication here as well. But before you start taking this apart, you've got to get it really solid so you can take other things apart. Most people, when they practice, they get in too much of a hurry. They get a little bit of concentration and say, okay, next thing is discernment. They turn on their concentration and destroy it. before it's really had a chance to do its work. We always like to figure things out too much in advance. After all, we think we're clever, take less energy, take less time if we move on as fast as possible. But some things you can't rush. The image the Buddha gives is of a woman who's pregnant. and She asks her husband to take a monkey and dye it, so that when the child is born, the child will have a little monkey to play with. And the, monkey, and the husband wants to know what color to dye it, depending on whether it's a boy or a girl. So he opened up the woman's womb right then. Of course, that kills the child. Some things you can't rush. That's with training the mind. You've got to get it really solidly established, get really centered here on the breath. Don't worry about the next step, where it's going to go. Have a, have a general sense okay, that when you settle in the breath, this is not the ultimate. You know that it's simply a temporary resting spot, you, but you're trying to make it as good and as comfortable as possible, as solid as possible, so it can provide you the framework with which you can see other things that are more and more refined. Try to have, inhabit this world as continuously as possible, the world of the present moment, the world of the, where things are kept simple, body in and of itself, feelings in and of themselves, mind states, mind qu mental qualities in and of themselves, before they get turned into something else through that control key that shifts your frame of reference. Keep this frame of reference as consistent as possible so you can see the other movements of the mind understand how they happen, how things come about, how they arise, how they stay, how they pass away. Try to keep this spot as solid as possible so you can see those other subtle movements in the mind. And that, you find, will cut away a lot of the suffering that goes along with those things. Without this solid foundation, just washed away. The world gets swept away, you get swept away along with it. The world offers no shelter, you've lost your shelter here in the present moment. These worlds have nothing of their own. Well, you have nothing of your own in the present moment because you keep destroying it, letting it go, letting it go, not working on it, not continuing with it. So do your best to establish a good, solid state in the, right here in the present moment, at whatever level you can, whether it's simply the level of not getting involved in the greed and sorrow for the worlds that come blowing through your mind, or whether you're more and more independent. Ultimately, you want to get to the point where you're totally independent of any world. That's not chikinchi loke upadi di anisito viharati, as I say on the Satipatthana Sutta. You dwell independent, not attached to anything in the world. That's the direction you want to go. You're not attached to any world at all. So whether it's simply the level of withstanding the worlds that seem to be totally beyond your control, or you're getting more and more in control, whatever level you're at, do your best to stay as solid as possible and as uninvolved as possible. And don't get upset because you're not totally uninvolved. Work at whatever level you find yourself. because the work of the practice does build. 
It is a path where you can make progress. Sometimes it's just step by step. A lot of people say, well, I don't want that. I want sudden progress. I want sudden awakening. Well, things can happen suddenly, but there's no understanding. There's no skill that comes with sudden things that happen in the mind. And we are working on a skill here, the skill of learning to stay centered, keeping this frame of reference, not shifting to others. Just that skill in and of itself can cut through a lot of suffering. So as you meditate, try to keep your nose down, keep close to the ground as possible. And as always, it's the people who keep their nose down. Those are the ones who sniff interesting things, find out interesting things that everybody else tends to overlook. <laughs>